Oh, okay. <laughs> oh man. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Abigail Ridge with the California Commission on Disability Access. We'll be getting ready in just a moment. We're going to wait for some more attendees to join the meeting. Good afternoon, Stephanie. This is Abigail. I just want to make sure that you are all set up for captioning for today's event. We're going to assign you as captioner right now in a second, so we'll get you all set up. What did you do, Dennis? I got to make sure that this building provides equity. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we ensured that the meeting was fully accessible. I want to welcome all of you to our forum today, Disability Access for Small Businesses. My name is April Dawson Rawlings, and I am the Executive Director of the California Commission on Disability Access, and I'm also serving as today's moderator. The mission of the California Commission on Disability Access, or CCDA, is to increase disability access across California through dialogue and collaboration with stakeholders, including but not limited to the disability and business communities, as well as all levels of government. CCDA lives our mission through organizing stakeholder trainings and events such as this one, creating and disseminating technical manuals, educating elected officials, and tracking trends in disability access litigation related to construction and website related disability access claims. Last August, CCDA launched a three-year initiative to create spaces of engagement, dialogue, and training around access to communities across California. I am excited to be in Monterey County today. Accessibility to businesses starts with conversations and actions at the local level. My hope is that the relationships fostered today will lead to proactive solutions to providing access to businesses for people with disabilities in Monterey County. I now have the pleasure of introducing Juan P. Rodriguez, a civil rights officer of the Monterey County Civil Rights Office and co-sponsor of this event. Juan? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for attending. 
Um, I'm really grateful to the uh, April, her team, Phil, Abigail, uh, and to the California Commission on Disability Access for helping us put on this event. Obviously, I'm extremely grateful to the panelists, some of which I know, some of which I'm looking forward to get to know today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit, and, and uh, my team knows if I am, um, unfortunately my printer didn't work, so I didn't, I wasn't able to print some, uh, <laughs> uh, some words for you today, so I'm ad-libbing, but if, when I do that, um, I tend to ramble on. So, to keep myself on track, I'm going to skip what our office does. Please know um, I'm the civil rights officer, as I, um, Abigail said. Um, April said, I'm sorry, and uh, we're here. Essentially, our mission for the county is to provide or help the county provide equitable services for everyone. Um, we have the honor to work with the Commission on Disabilities, and I'm going to read to you what their mission is from their bylaws because I'm terrible at memorizing things. So, the Commission on Disabilities' mission is to establish a framework that allows the Commission to fulfill its role as advisor to the Board of Supervisors regarding matters related to equal employment, public services, communications, and public accommodations for people with disabilities. Part of the bylaws also talk about the strategy being helping county government, but also uh, the private sector in um, helping with access for people with disabilities. And that's why we're here today. Um, I almost forgot to also thank Richard Vaughn, our economic developer, uh, development management manager, and then a couple of businesses that helped uh, sponsor uh, uh, today, which is the California Business Properties Association and Building Business Back. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to April. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. And in order to ensure full accessibility to all of our participants, I am now going to talk a little bit about how we're modeling accessibility today. So I'm going to describe myself. I am a, a white woman with brown eyes and uh, salt and pepper blonde hair. I'm wearing a pink striped suit uh, with some white and black stripes in it. And I have a white blazer and I am a wheelchair user. And some of the ways that we have physically um, ensured access today is in addition to our captioning and American Sign Language and Spanish interpreting, we also are in a room that is designed to be accessible for people with disabilities. There's cutouts for wheelchairs and there's instructions on how people with disabilities can get to the dais. And uh, we also... Thank you so much, April. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abigail Ridge, she, her pronouns, and I am the administrative and legislative analyst with the California Commission on Disability Access. I am a white woman with long, dark, dark, blonde, dark blonde hair, and I have blue eyes and glasses. I'm wearing a black turtleneck sweater as well as blue, blue slacks. So right now, I'm gonna use this opportunity to give a brief overview of Zoom accessibility features that will be available throughout today's event. First, please, if you are comfortable, please turn on your camera when speaking. Please keep your audio muted when you're not speaking. We will have a designated time on the agenda to respond to questions. At that time, you may ask verbally or utilize the Q&A feature. I will go over this Q&A feature um, in the next slide. Please note that the chat feature is distracting for people with disabilities who use the screen reading software. Please use the raise hand icon when you wish to speak and we will call on speakers. Speak slowly and wait for others to finish before joining in. And please note that this meeting will be recorded and available for viewing online. The Q&A portion of this event will not be recorded. Now for the Q&A session. For the Q&A session of this event, to ask a question, please select Q&A at the bottom of the screen. You will see at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, if you are attending virtually, different icons. You want to utilize the two dialog bubbles that are labeled Q&A, which is outlined in one of the images at the bottom on the screen. On the slide, there are two images. The one at the bottom is the Zoom black toolbar with a red circle around the Q&A function. To the right, there is a white pop-out, which will go ahead and pop up on the screen whenever you click on the Q&A function at the bottom menu bar. On that function, you'll be able to input your question throughout the webinar. Please note that the Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation and selected questions will be answered. 
For Zoom, there are different viewing options. In the upper right-hand corner, where it's labeled View on the Zoom screen, you can have the option to choose between Speaker, Gallery, or Standard View. On the right, there is a pop-out that is indicating what will happen when you click out the View function on the Zoom screen. From there, if you would like to change different view options, click on View Options during a PowerPoint presentation, and you will be able to adjust the various Zoom features. There is a second image on the screen which outlines the view options portion that you can utilize to change the zoom options. Additionally, during a PowerPoint, if you would like, additionally during a PowerPoint, if you would like to change the minimize or to enlarge the PowerPoint presentation, please utilize the slider between the PowerPoint presentation and the participants. An image of the slider is presented to the right. It is a gray little toolbar with about three horizontal lines. For Zoom live captioning during this event, to turn on captioning, please select the CC icon that is labeled Show Captions on the menu bar. The menu bar, again, is a black toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and you want to be able to, you want to switch on the CC options. To change the size of the captions, you can select the CC options. There is a little up arrow, a little carrot that is an up arrow. On that, you will be able to change the different settings. To move the captions, you can hover the generated captions and drag them to a desired location. To turn off the location, to turn off the captions, you can turn them off by using the black zoom menu bar at the bottom of the screen and click hide captions. Zoom also has language features for today's event. Please note, Spanish is the only alternative language option that we are providing. To turn on language interpretation, please select the globe icon, which is located at the menu bar at the bottom of the screen. From there, when you click on the, goal, the globe icon, another pop-out will display. From there, you'll be able to click on the desired language. To hear the interpreted language only, click mute original audio. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to April Dawson. Thank you, Abigail. I'm really proud that we're able to create a fully accessible event for everyone today and to model our values with our actions. Next, we are going to move into the learning portion of our event, and I am very pleased to, uh, to announce that we have a speaker today, Roger Miller. Roger is a certified access specialist with Eagle Project Management, LLC, and he's also a commissioner on the Monterey County uh, Commission, Commission on Disabilities. And uh, I'll say a few words about Mr. Miller. He has a proven background as both an owner's representative and project manager. He's uh, created several projects within an, the allocated budget. And he has an extensive knowledge of construction management, private and public projects. And he's worked for several different agencies, such as school district, public agencies, hospitals, hotels, commercial production facilities. And he has provided project management consulting services for over 42 years. And so I will now give the floor to uh, Roger, who is to my left, who will be presenting on the role of a CASP and business access tips uh, for serving customers with disabilities. Roger. Thank you, April. I'm Roger Miller. I'm a certified access specialist. I'm, I have brown hair, white male, and a blue suit. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of a CASP in your projects. Next slide. The certified access specialist program was completed by the was developed by the division of the state architect to provide the business owners access to individuals with specialized knowledge of the applicability of state and federal construction related standards. Of note, only a CAS can provide services that offer you qualified defendant status in a construction related accessibility lawsuit. Next slide. I want to emphasize I'm not an attorney or I'm not an architect, but I am a certified access specialist with 50 years of construction experience, 14 years as a CASP. I've done over 200 reports, 
including services I've provided include design reviews, field assessments, and litigation support. Next slide. This is some of the typical services that a CASP can provide, and you can get these services from pretty much any CASP that provides field services. Some CASPs are strictly business building officials and don't provide the field services, but the field service CASP provide program development, which is the scope in which defines what regulations apply to your project. Simplified walkthroughs, or we do diligence if you're gonna rent a place or purchase a place we can help you figure out what the accessibility requirements are for that project and budget accordingly. Full cash inspection reports which help you identify what's not compliant in your property. Remodel or addition consulting where we can help you define the scope of services you're gonna to need to meet the 20% typical accessibility requirements when you do a remodel and other consulting services. Next slide. Today my focus will be on public accommodations, which are properties like the ones listed here that provide goods and services to the general public. That's where most of the CASP services are called upon. Different requirements apply to government facilities and multifamily housing, and that can be just a subject of a different presentation. Next slide. The underlying issue with accessibility is that typically the built environment is not accessible to people with disabilities. I'd have you think about a, how a customer with a disability would navigate your space and access goods and services. Can they reach the stuff that's on the shelves? Can they maneuver around with a wheelchair? Can somebody that's visually impaired use your point of sale machine to be able to make a purchase? Those types of things. Next slide. Now you went back. One more. One thing about terminology, the, the terminology handicapped is an old terminology and not very comfortable for people that are disabled. The new terminology is disabled. And the photo here is of a guy that does extreme wheelchair st stunts. He does flips and rolls and pretty amazing stuff. He's available on YouTube. You want to see somebody that's disabled but fully functional in the world, check out his YouTube. Next slide. So the underlying issue with accessibility and thinking in terms of equal, equal, they want to make sure that people that are disabled have equal access to everything that people that are not disabled have. George Bush passed the, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. And a quote from him said, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. This historic act is the world's first comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities, the first. Next line. Why provide accessibility to your business? First of all, it's good business. There's a $3 trillion market segment out there of people that are disabled. One of the anecdotes I've got is that I was in a restaurant a couple of years ago and a person arrived in a wheelchair with about a dozen family members to come into the restaurant, and the only way into the restaurant was with stairs. So they turned and left, and what do you think they told all their friends? So that dozen people told another dozen people told another dozen people not to use that restaurant. Um, it's good for disabled individuals. We're all likely to have some sort of disability sometime in our life. You're going to break a leg, sprain an ankle, or have something more severe happen in your life. It helps disabled individuals become productive community members and function in society with dignity. And thirdly, discriminating against individuals with a disability is illegal and it's wrong. Next slide. Like I said, it's illegal to discriminate against disabled individuals. The regulations are complicated, but there is help. Regulations are only enforced by a building permit or a lawsuit. And if you don't want to be subject to a lawsuit, we're going to talk about ways you can avoid a lawsuit later on in the presentation. Next slide. So how do I avoid a lawsuit? First of all, make your property fully accessible, but a lot of times that's not either readily achievable. So the next, the best thing is to have your property inspected 
preferably by a certified access specialist, and develop an implementation plan as stipulated in the federal regulations. If you're getting ready to purchase a property or sign a lease to a pre-purchase investigation before you buy or lease a property. I got involved in a lawsuit about a year ago with a restaurant owner and a, a, the landlord that got sued because the property was not as accessible. And the lawsuit, the, the, the restaurant owner and the property owner spent more money fighting each other over who was going to address the lawsuit and the accessibility requirements than they... <laughs> Tell me, asses. Okay, I'm not sure what that was about. If you have a property that is not fully accessible, do what you can to accommodate the needs, special needs of disabled individuals, like offering to get stuff off an upper shelf or other, other things that you can do that make it easier for somebody that's disabled. You can not give them a reason to be upset. Next slide. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there about lawsuits, and I'm going to just list a couple of them. I've got a list of them here. I'm just going to tell you some of the highlights. One is that all ADA accessibility lawsuits are frivolous lawsuits, and that's not the case. A lot of times somebody sues after putting, somebody, putting the owner on notice that the property is not accessible, and the owner doesn't re respond. The other misconception is all plaintiffs are vexatious litigants, and that's not true. Most most people that are disabled want to function in the facility, but if you've got a bathroom where somebody can't use the bathroom and they're in a restaurant and they got to go to the bathroom, the outcome is going to be pretty ugly and it's embarrassing for them and that's what leads to a lawsuit. Also, people are under the impression that a pre-litigation notice is required before filing a lawsuit, which is not the case. As I said, only the landlords and tenants need to be clear on the, in their relationship on who's responsible for accessibility. Next slide. Another one I hear a lot is grand, older buildings are grandfathered in, and that's not the case. In 1990, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, it had a stipulation that any building that was not fully accessible needed to have a program of architectural barrier removal where it's readily achievable. and should have been spending money since 1990 to make improvements. Using a general contractor or the licensed general contractor or building permit, building official guarantees accessibility is compliance is 100%, and that's not true either. Contractors are great at taking what's on the drawings and turning it into what's built in the environment. There's their experience in code and understanding what regulations apply is limited, and you shouldn't rely on that. Lastly, only will, those in wheelchairs are considered disabled persons. You've got people that are walkers, will use walkers, people that have heart conditions, people that are visually impaired. Classic story is a guy in a Harley Davidson pulls up and parks in a disabled parking space. Somebody comes up to him and says, you're not disabled, you're driving a Harley Davidson. The guy has a heart condition and says, I can't walk more than 50 feet. So not all disabilities are easy to see. Next slide. This is the top 10 allegations, construction-related ADA violations in 2022 filed by the California Commission on Disabilities. It's available in their annual report. As you'll notice, so that nine of the 10 accessibility issues that were subject to lawsuits are exterior to the building. Only one of them is the access to goods and services. So you're the person filing a lawsuit oftentimes comes to the building and can't get in the front door, and that's what precipitates the lawsuit. Next slide. So some examples of stuff that's not compliant. I've got some photographs here. In toilet rooms, there's a lot of things that need to be compliant. The sink on the upper left-hand corner, a person in a wheelchair can't get underneath the sink with their wheelchair to use the sink. The sign on the door is the wrong kind of sign. It's supposed to be a triangle or a circle or a triangle with a circle. In a couple of the photos, the grab bars are in the wrong location. Toilet paper dispensers are in the wrong location. And the toilet seat dispensers in the wrong location. Now, some of these situations are design situations when the property is built. Some of them are something that happens after the property has been built. 
and somebody comes along and has the toilet paper dispenser in the wrong place or moves something and then defeats the accessibility. Next slide. Parking is also a problem and parking spaces need to be level. You need to have a tow-away sign. The lower left-hand corner is a tow-away sign that should be at the front of a parking lot or an accessible parking space. And it's supposed to have a phone number to call to tow away a car that's parked in and without a placard. People put the sign up often without the phone number. The sketch on the lower end, right hand side shows a diagonal parking space and frequently I find these striped incorrectly. It takes a lot more space than one thinks to make it fully accessible. Lastly, you need to have an accessible path to travel from the parking space to the front entrance of the property. Oftentimes that's not the case. If somebody gets out of their car in a wheelchair and can't make it to the front door. Next slide. Doors are always an issue. Closing force and opening force of a door frequently becomes a problem. The keypads I'm showing here were something I experienced in the lawsuit. The, the store owner was having trouble with homeless using the bathroom, so he put a numbered keypad on the door so that only patrons could use it. But the number five didn't have the little raised button that somebody was visually impaired needed to be able to determine how to enter the code. And the person went to use the bathroom and couldn't get in and filed a lawsuit. Next slide. Stairs often are not accessible. They, they don't have the proper handrails. They have open risers. The one on the right has open risers, which is not allowed. They don't have low landings at the top and bottom. And oftentimes something that's really inexpensive to do is not done, and that's painting the yellow stripe or contrasting color stripe on the nosing of the stairs so somebody that's visually impaired can see the steps themselves. And that's not just an accessibility issue. That's a trip and fall danger. You don't want somebody tripping down the steps because they couldn't see the nosing of the step. Counters are oftentimes not accessible. Um, a counter in California needs to be at 34 inches, and the federal regulations allow 36. And you got to provide the accessibility requirements that provide the most accessibility. The other thing that happens often is you're supposed to have an open 36 inch wide section on the counter where transactions can be encountered. And the counter's designed that way and then you put a bunch of goods and services or goods available for sale in this open space and now you don't have the open space anymore. The other thing I mentioned earlier is point of sale devices. Somebody visually impaired needs to be able to enter their key code on a point of sale device. Next slide. This is a summary of some of the disability regulations that have been passed over the last 20 years, 30 years or so. There's always something coming up each year trying to buy, clarify the disability regulations. But the bottom line is, whenever people try to pass a, regula pass a new Senate bill or, or law that, that eliminates the lawsuits, the complaint comes back that you've had since 1990 to make the properties accessible, and we haven't done that. So the lawsuit seems to be the only way to enforce it. Next slide. A little bit of history. The federal regulations started in 1968 with the Architectures Barrier Act, followed with the Rehabilitation Act. In 1986, they came out with an ANSI standard that started the regulations for accessibility. 1988, HUD passed regulations for accessibility in multifamily housing. In 1990 was the Americans with Disabilities Act. Next slide. These are some of the standards that apply and they overlap with one another. It's one of the things that a CAST can help you do is identify which of the regulations apply to your property and identify the part of the regulations that provides the most accessibility. It can be pretty confusing if you don't um, understand all the regulations. When I passed my exam, the reading material for the accessibility regulations, we had to study where it was over 3,000 pages long. Next slide. In California, the UNRWA Act includes minimum damages for violations of ADA, and that's what really precipitates the litigation that you may be familiar with. 1968 Building Code corresponding with ANSI 117.1 was when accessibility regulations first started to appear in the building code in California. We've had a number of Senate bills, 1608, which, compared, which created the Certified Access Specialist Program, 
Senate Bills 269 and 1186 provided some grace periods for claims if you have a CASP inspection ahead of time. One of the recent bills, Assembly Bill 3002, encouraged building officials to, or asked building officials to encourage CASP inspections when a building permit is pulled or when a business license is pulled. I would encourage you, if you have an occasion to pull a building permit or a business license, to really consider having a CASP inspection as part of that process. Next slide. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details on the California Civil Code. It was what defines the regulations and what it was enforceable by lawsuit. One of the things that I'll highlight on that is in each case where the California Code offers a stay in litigation, they require a CASP inspection before you get sued. Getting a CASP inspection after you got sued is like closing the barn door after the horse got out already. Next slide. These are some forms that you can use to in the process. I'm not going to talk too much about them. Go on then. Next slide. So the owner, what's the lawsuit going to cost me? Most of your cost is going to be tied up in attorney fees um, that allows for three times the actual damage if somebody is physically injured and a minimum of $4,000 per item if you get sued. Typically, it costs less for an access, accessibility assessment than the settlement of one violation. Next slide. These are some of the typical lawsuits that we see. I've been involved in a lot of various lawsuits, usually after the fact. One interesting one was a hotel that was built in the early 2000s got sued and they had over 300 items in their lawsuit that the plaintiff complained. That was only the items where the plaintiff was affected. It wasn't every item in the property. Um, common lawsuits are doors, parking, counters, accessible dining. This, that's a simple one to fix. A four-legged table usually provides accessibility to somebody in a wheelchair. Those center-legged tables will work. Toilet rooms are often not accessible. Next slide. Next, next slide. Thank you. The Certified Access Specialty Program was established by Senate Bill 1608. It's administered by the State of California, the Division of the State Architect. Uh, last time I checked, there were about 870 Certified Access Specialists in the state. 371 of them listed the inspections as their Scope of services. In the 831 area code, there were eight casts and four due inspections. The, the key takeaway from the Certified Access Specialist Program is we have a clear understanding of the regulations and how to apply them. Next slide. We can help ensure compliance where there's some protections if you have an inspection. Some, some circumstances, you can get a 90-day stay reduce damages, and early, the big key is getting an early conference with the specialist judge that the number sort of short circuits the uh, legal fees. Additional benefits are that if you have an accessibility assessment, you can start implementing changes that make your property more accessible as, you, as time goes on, as money is available. It allows you to budget for facility accessibility. When you get sued, you typically are told to fix everything right away. Whereas when you have an accessibility assessment, you can do that over a period of years. Next slide. So these are some of the ways a cash consultant can help. We can educate owners, do pre-purchase assessments, make sure design is fully compliant. Um, a lot of times I'll review an architect's design and his details aren't complete enough to ensure accessibility is complied with when the contractor builds it out. We can do surveys of existing facilities, um, surveys of facilities that have been completed. And we can help as expert witness in litigation. If you, get, if you get notified of a lawsuit, I encourage you to get an attorney and have the attorney hire a CASP. That way, the CASP work is protected. Next. 
So how do I make my facility accessible? First thing I would suggest is hire a CAS to inspect the facility. It seems expensive sometimes, but what we did, hire an amateur. This is not a do-it-yourself project. Typically costs less than, for an assessment than one violation. You can find a CASP on the DSA website. That's the link to the website. Get an inspection, get a written report with details. Next. Development implementation plan and follow the implementation plan. Sadly, I do a, a lot of reports and the, the owner never puts together an implementation plan or follows it. Next slide. There is some financial assistance available. There's some tax credits and tax deductions. And there's a CalCap program where you can get funding for accessibility if you're a small business. Next slide. So what does a report look like? This is one of the pages out of one of my reports that lists all the elements that we looked at, the doors, the path of travel, the bathrooms, the conference rooms, in this case, the washers and dryers. The ones in pink have something that's not compliant and is expanded on further in the report. On the right-hand side is the page you turn to the report to see what the details of what's not correct about that particular element. Next slide. This is the reference to the item that was not compliant. You'll notice that on the upper right, it's a little hard to read, but there's a keynote that shows where the item that we're dealing with is. There's a description of what was found. In this case, the $255 fine sign was not provided. It gives you a simplified solution, and then it gives you some basic code references. It also lists the checklist items in a photo of the area that we did the inspection. Next slide. Looks like that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and if you've got any questions, I'll be glad to answer what I can. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we will do a very brief uh, question and answer for Roger. We are going to have a, a more extensive question and answer um, at the end of the, toward the end of the presentation. Um, does anyone on Zoom have a question for Roger? And if, just let me know if somebody is asking a question. No, no, no questions is what staff is telling me. If anyone in person has a question, you can raise your hand or go up to the podium and we have um, someone in a, teal blue shirt helping, helping you. Juan has a question. <laughs> so thank you, April. So say, Roger, I, I own a restaurant and I have some money to remodel it, but I want to make sure I'm complying. Um, what would you, obviously I would go to a general contractor or somebody I know, right, to help me build it. What would you advise I do in terms of uh, CASP in that situation? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I wouldn't just go to a contractor. I'd go to an architect or design professional. And I would have a CASP review the drawings for what you're doing and also have a CASP inspect the existing facility to help you identify things that you have to do for the 20%. Um, in California, if you, if you do a remodel that's below the valuation threshold, which is about $200,000, you only have to spend 20% of the cost of the remodel on accessibility improvements. If you're over the, that threshold, you could have to spend more. So typically you can have me come and do a, uh, an assessment of the property, identify what's not compliant, and use that as your list of things that you're gonna do for the 20%. And then have me review the drawings that the architect puts together to make sure that you're not leaving yourself something that the contractor can interpret incorrectly and make it not compliant. Okay, that, and, and I heard when you were presenting that if I have a plan, I can, those improvements I can do over uh, several years, right? And, uh, as long as I have a plan for it. I also, or maybe I'm incorrect on that, but. Um, You're correct. I'm correct, right. And then I also saw that there's financial assistance like uh, tax credits, uh, deductions, and 88 state financing program. If I have a, if I hire a CASP, 
and they have a plan for me to become compliant within a couple of years, do you know if I can use these incentives over the years, or is it just one-time use? You'd have to talk to a tax professional. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that was going to be the answer, but all right. The, the CalCap program is a, is a loan program. Okay. But no at interest least loans for small businesses, I believe. But at least there's something, right, to yes. support businesses to, to do the transition. Yes. And in some cities, in the city of San Jose, they got a program that actually reimburses you for your accessibility improvements. Wow. Um, be something good for the county to consider is something to consider here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. This is April. Thank you for that informative presentation. And we have a question. Uh, Monica is going to come up to the dais and ask her question. Uh, my name is um, Monica. I'm Latina and, and South Asian, dark skin, dark hair, wearing a cream-colored blazer with stripes. My question to Roger is this. I think fear of compliance, I'm, I'm with the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce thinking about businesses. The fear of the cost of compliance is a concern. Have you any experience with any business groups or neighboring businesses kind of collaborating, collaborating to make a shared space accessible so they can have more clients or visitors use their property. What I'm thinking of specifically is something like Fisherman's Wharf in Monterey or some sort of business association like that. I don't have an experience with that. I thought typically the common areas of a building are the responsibility of the landlord and then all the tenants have the responsibility for internal. So for the wharf that you're talking about, the common area I believe is owned by the city and it would be their responsibility to make the common area, the common bathrooms accessible and then everybody inside the door of their restaurant or store would be responsible for accessibility. And the, the implementation plan can take lo less expensive stuff. It's, the idea is you do what's readily achievable. It means that it is not without too much cost and not too much impact. So things like making counters the right height, having a point of sale machine that has the raise button on number five, making doors so they have the correct threshold or fairly low cost items that you can do to make improvements. You don't have to move structural walls and make major improvements. You can do minor stuff. And if you track all that, that helps you in the case where you get sued. And a second question follow-up would be regarding websites. That wouldn't need a CASP. Is that something businesses can do online or find resources online that they can do internally themselves as a accessible and affordable way that they can... Um, be compliant. You know, I don't do websites, although I follow the, the litigation on the websites. The federal regulations have just come out with a detailed description of what's required on a website. Now, what I suggest is you hire a website designer that is familiar with those regulations. If you need a contact for somebody like that, I've got the guy that does my website knows those regulations inside and out. Great. And uh, that's why I picked him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going we're gonna, to uh, move forward. And I want to thank Roger for his insight and for your work as a certified access specialist. And I also want to say to, to Monica's point about websites, uh, we are actually, as the California Commission on Disability Access, we're going to be coming out with a toolkit later this year about website accessibility. Uh, and so we'll be able to assist businesses with that soon. And um, before we take a short break, you know, we've, we've, we've introduced ourselves, we've modeled accessibility, we've talked about um, what a CASP is and some of, the, some of the tips that businesses can use to take back with you to your businesses about being accessible. But one of the things that I think is really important is that we really hear for the voices of the customers. Because I know that one of the, the key things about being a business owner 
and about just being in the business community is, is thinking about who am I serving? You know, what, who do I get up every day to, to when I open my store or serve my pancakes or, you know, sell, sell my, my, my gadgets? Who, who am I serving? And, and I think it's important for all of us to get to know one another and that the dialogue can really spark change. And so, we're going to now move into the voices of the customer portion. And I have three customers here today, uh, Whitney Clark, Raymond Torres, and Johnny Morales. And they've agreed to share a little bit of their story. And so I'm gonna start with you, Whitney. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what's one thing that you want a business owner to know about serving a customer with a disability? Uh, my name is Whitney Clark, and I live uh, in Monterey, California, uh, living independently, and I just had my third uh, anniversary living at my apartment last month, which I'm very happy about. Now, as far as... Uh, having a business or a customer or something like that. Um, I think that um, customers at different uh, businesses or whatnot um, would be really happy or appreciative to um, meet other people and to get to know them um, as far as like if they want to get a job or anything like that. Thank you, Whitney. And we'll be hearing more from Whitney uh, later in the panel presentation. Uh, Johnny, same question. Can you share a little bit about yourself and just from your lens as a customer, what is one thing you want businesses to know about serving uh, customers with disabilities? Uh, well, one is not to be afraid of uh, helping a person like myself who, I'm a quadriplegic, complete, um, so I can't move my hands to get my wallet out. I have an experience where I went to um, a sandwich shop and um, I ordered to go and when it came down to pay, I asked if they can help me get my wallet out of my pouch. And she was scared to do that. She was very hesitant and said, I don't know, I can't do that. Uh, so I ended up leaving without my, my, my order. And uh, so I guess to educate, educate people who, uh, about people with disabilities who uh, don't want to be uh, out, out like an outcast, you know. Um, so, yeah, no, you know, basically just not being afraid to help someone out in my situation. Thank you. The takeaways I'm hearing so far is, you know, freedom from fear, not being afraid, and uh, to go that, it'll, that extra step to build a relationship and help someone and talk to your customer. I think that one of the things, too, to your point, is always making sure that one of the tips when I do trainings is um, to, to ask the customer, how may I assist you, and have that dialogue, and start with the dialogue. And Whitney, what you said about building community, I think, you know, one of the things I love about small businesses is that you're really the fabric of your local community and, and a gathering place for lots of different people. So thinking about who, who you know, you know, taking a, a, a couple of, every couple of months, you know, having your team walk through your space and thinking about how would a person with a developmental disability walk through my space or experience my programs or how could a person, would a person who's a quadriplegic do that or someone who's deaf or um, someone with a sensory disability is always a really good idea. And um, I also have the same question for Raymond. Uh, Raymond, could you tell us a, a little bit about yourself and what you'd like uh, business owners to know about serving customers with disabilities? Uh, yes, hello, my name is Raymond Torres. I've uh, been disabled for 24 years now. Uh, my condition's a little different, it's more chronic. And uh, I think a lot of it, what I've seen, I live in a senior complex in Monterey, California. 
And a lot of the things that I've noticed is accessibility, helping people when they're shopping because they're on, like, for instance, Johnny, or they're using their walkers. It's hard for them to get around. There's not enough space. You know, parking, for instance, you know, getting in to the stores. A lot of them, they have the buttons, but the buttons are high. And if you're in a wheelchair, you have to come up and move it. You have the pole that you can use to hit. So I think a lot of it is accessibility. You know, if you can get great accessibility, it'll work out. Thank you, Raymond. I, I, I really appreciate what you said about uh, about making sure that your your physical space is accessible to people with disabilities, thinking about how someone would navigate the space, and that really goes back to you know there's a there's a term in access world of uh, maintaining accessible features, and I know that as a person who uses a wheelchair myself, uh, sometimes like when I when I go you know let's say I'm at a restaurant or something or a gift shop and I need to use the bathroom, uh, sometimes uh, you know there's there's uh, walkways that aren't accessible or there's like, that's where sometimes I see storage of uh, excess items that is hard to find to put somewhere else. So they put it in the access aisle and, um, and sometimes, you know, a bathroom might have a really beautiful planter in it, but it means that I can't turn <laughs> to, to use the toilet. And so just maintaining accessible features. So what I really heard from the voices of the customer today is, the role that businesses can play in building community for everyone, uh, not being afraid of people with lots of different disabilities, not being afraid to reach out and, and just ask that person, what, do, what needs to happen today to fully access my business and how can I help you and have a dialogue and not being afraid of that dialogue. And also just maintaining accessible features and thinking about how not every disability is, not every disability is permanent. Some of them are, are chronic and some of them aren't visible. So I want to thank the customers. The customers are going to, to stay up and be a part of our larger panel. And we're going to take a five minute break to, uh, do, to switch out uh, the room a little bit um, in order to bring in uh, two more panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. So it's 3.56, we're gonna come back at 4.01. Okay, thank you.
started in 60 seconds. April, and uh, I want to welcome you back to our program, uh, Disability Access for Small Businesses. The first half of our presentation, uh, we did a lot of things. We, we welcomed each other. We learned about how to import the importance of modeling access, both in person and on on the internet and Zoom. Uh, we heard from a local certified access specialist where we talked about the importance of businesses uh, providing access to people with disabilities and the role of a certified access specialist and ways to help. And we also heard briefly from some customers who are gonna be rejoining us for this panel portion about what they want businesses to know about access for people with disabilities and how to serve customers with disabilities. And now we're going to go into a discussion uh, and we've assembled a, a group of uh, business representatives as well as uh, customers with disabilities. And one of the reasons why we do these forums is because you know CCDA is all about teaching all of us that we're all more alike than we're different. And as I mentioned earlier, accessibility and questions about accessibility to businesses really sparks at the local level. So if we could all get to know each other at events like these, you know, maybe maybe the next time somebody goes into a business and they find an access issue, they'll be like, oh, hey, I think I saw you at that meeting. How about we have a cup of coffee and I could tell you what happened and uh, talk through this. And then businesses can also learn about how to uh, be proactive rather than reactive when it comes to access. So we all get to know each other and realize, hey, maybe we're a little bit more alike than we thought. So today, for today's panel, I'm pleased to welcome Monica Lal, who is the President and CEO of the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. We also have Robert Freire. <laughs> no, tell me if I did it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Robert, who is the Executive Director of the Gateway Center of Monterey County Incorporated. Uh, on Zoom, we have Michelle Davis, who is the Supervising Architect uh, for the Division of the State Architect, as well as our returning customers, Raymond Torres, uh, Johnny Morales, and Whitney Clark. And I also want to give a shout out to the Central Coast Center for Independent Living and Maria, who uh, assisted us with uh, our customer panel today, as well as thank you, Robert, for also helping us with our, uh, for uh, recruiting customers for our panel today. So our first question, goes to Monica. Monica, as a representative of the business community, what do you see as the greatest barriers faced by businesses in Monterey County to achieving access compliance for customers with disabilities? And what are your suggestions for how those bar barriers can be removed or reduced? Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think for some of the business commu community, there's a, a legitimate lack of awareness and uh, a lack of awareness in related to the CASP that Roger so clearly outlined, just some of the actions that they can take to make it more accessible. Um, I think in terms of an obstacle, uh, cost of compliance is a concern, whether it's real or um, a fear of a cost. Uh, and, and even what, what even doing research on it um, might create for them. Uh, and then a little bit, truthfully, in some of our businesses is attitude. I think sometimes not uh, overtly really recognizing that um, access is very important to a business and s perhaps seeing the, the disabled as a small segment of the population when really it's not and it, has, it can have a significant impact um, and that uh, 
perhaps the costly demands that they, they perceive, that there would, wouldn't be necessarily a financial return when in fact the return is in, in our mind and how we would like to educate many fold uh, of having properties accessible. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. No, thank you, Monica. I think it, it really speaks to the fact that um, customers are such a, customers with disabilities, you know, represent, you know, millions of dollars in, in revenue for our businesses nationwide. And um, that even though it can seem like, I, you know, even though there's a cost associated with uh, business access, there are resources out there. And I do want to take the opportunity to point out that all of the resources that we're going to be talking about today, as well as some other resources we'll be highlighting toward the end of the presentation, we made available to all the attendees, uh, as well as this recording. Uh, so what we want to make sure we help businesses, uh, you know, manage the cost of, of accessibility and, and integrate it into how they do, how they do business. So I appreciate, appreciate you being here today. And uh, I'd like to start with Whitney. As a customer with a disability, can you tell, tell me what, what do you think are some of the most common barriers faced by people with disabilities in accessing businesses? And how do you think that businesses could solve those problems? Well, I think that uh, businesses, uh, like I had tried to say, uh, earlier was that um, if like um, I'm just using an example but say there's um, a business um, that's not doing so well as far as um, money or anything like that in that scenario um, then there would be people, uh, out there that would, uh, help other people if they need, need it or any, uh, support on how to do things better or anything like that. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, Raymond, can you share as a customer with a disability what you believe are the most common barriers uh, faced by people with disabilities in accessing businesses and any recommendations that you have to offer to address those issues? Well, I already mentioned the accessibility, but I think when they, if like they come into a town or a city when they're going to get their license, if there's any programs that they can mention with the city, and can the city can advise them, look at if you need to do any, any accommodations, there's these programs that can help you. That way they can get a jump start on it already. I think that, that would be a, you know, something that could help out. And what about you, Johnny? What do you think are some common barriers to businesses faced by people with disabilities? And what are your recommendations for addressing those issues? You know, a lot. So uh, one of the issues we have is she's in a wheelchair as well. So having to be able to open that, she opens the door and I get in uh, just... Having a, every, if every uh, restaurant could have a button where they could just open it, it would be great where my mom doesn't have to struggle opening the door for me so we can both go in and enjoy a meal. Uh, another thing is that um, being as tall as I am, uh, I, my legs do not go under tables. And so that's one of the things that uh, uh, is a struggle. I usually go on the side of the table and and so, a space uh, mainly. I mean, it's a space to 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 sit and enjoy the meal. Um, and uh, customer service, just uh, having somebody to help. You know, those those issues. Thank you. I'm going to ask our uh, Division of the State Architect Representative, Michelle Davis, 
Could you share with our uh, attendees today, Michelle, what resources are available from the state to assist businesses to, to achieve access compliance? Hi, thank you, April. Um, we do have a website on the CAS or website page uh, um, on the CASP program. It lists some questions and answers and provides information, uh, basic information for business owners. We also maintain the certified access specialist uh, listing. So every CASP in the state is listed on our website and uh, the listing includes their contact information and whether or not they provide inspections and what counties they will provide inspections in. So if you're looking for somebody to do a CASP inspection, our website's a great place to start. Thank you. And we also have some information um, later in this PowerPoint, uh, in the PowerPoint slides, which we'll also be providing to the attendees about tax credits and some other things. You can also go to CCDA's website, uh, www.dgs.ca.gov slash CCDA. And uh, we have had to think about that for a minute. And we uh, have lots of, uh, lots of one pagers as well as toolkits. And um, I also want to give a plug that uh, the commission just approved a toolkit for co the construction industry on accessible parking, as well as for business owners and operators and facility owners on accessible parking. And uh, we will be uh, posting that to our website shortly, as well as in future uh, programming, uh, using that as a basis for some of our trainings. So if you're in those industries and want to learn more about accessible parking, uh, go to our website and uh, or contact us. So, uh, Robert, I want to bring you in, and I know you you have a unique position as a as a as a representative of an agency that serves people with disabilities. So I'd like to hear from you a little bit about you know what do you think are some of the common misconceptions. Uh, that are held by members of the business community about the access needs of the people you serve, and how do those misconceptions affect members of the community that you're serving? Thank you, April. Thank you for the opportunity to come speak at your um, forum, which is really important. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about me and Gateway Center, and I'll answer your question as part of that. But my name is Robert Ferrari. I'm the executive director with Gateway Center of Monterey County, who for 60 years has been serving the disabled community um, with quality programming, housing, um, and advocacy. So we um, are a residential program. We have day programs. And we have this really unique program that we have in partnership with Pacific Grove Adult School called Without Walls. And that's the program that, that one of the programs that Whitney's in, as well as we do do some supportive living program, which is another program that, um, that Whitney is in. And our goal and our mission is always to provide services so that um, the people in our care um, can live their best lives, have opportunities, access, um, and independence. And to get to your question, I think the, the misconceptions, um, more than what the misconceptions are, I think that um, what we can do is, uh, is really sort of break down some barriers, and that's what we try to do in, in our programs, whether it's the program that Whitney's in, which is for our young adults, or for our programs for our, our older adults. We all, they all go out in the community, they all participate in restaurants and parks and go to the beach and, and go to sporting events. I'm very excited. Um, the last two years, we've been able to go to the uh, Monterey Bay soccer um, facility, and it, it's easy peasy. It, uh, they got ramps there. They know we're coming. The bathrooms are nearby. Um, where we park our um, handicap accessible van is nearby. So they make it really easy. They're very thoughtful when they, when they re renovated that space. And so we're hoping that more people in the community are being that thoughtful when they're renovating their spaces um, so that folks like ours um, can participate. So to me, it's, it's a lot about um, first education, and then from education goes to interface, right? It's really an interface that matters. Um, being comfortable then leads to advocacy, then to me leads to open doors. <laughs> Here's to open doors. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Monica, 
As a representative of the business community, what are some misconceptions that you believe might be held by people with disabilities about the access efforts of business owners, and how do those misconceptions affect businesses um, in the in the county of Monterey? Well, I think some of the misconceptions might be that there's um, an active lack of willingness to make the the areas more accessible, um, and I and I. I don't think that's the case in the one the businesses I spoke to, just a few, so it's a small consensus. But I think I think more businesses would want to be compliant if they felt it was within their reach financially to be able to do it. Um, I don't think there are always active biases against um, having disabled persons use their um, services. And again, but some of it though is just a lack of awareness and education. And, and to the point of, of being comfortable. Um, Robert said it so well about just um, being educated to allow that interface. Um, and so I think more opportunities where their business engagement are, um, it's ha happening in educational seminars where it's not uh, us against them, but these type of scenarios. And again, a, a great example of Monterey Bay FC, which partners with so many of our members that this is a great example. Let's elevate it. Let's let's have our community know there are some great ones that exist. Maybe shine a light on them. You know, so other businesses say, "Hey, we can do that too." Thank you. I think this is, this definitely speaks to just the power of community getting together to have these conversations, and I, I agree with you, elevating elevating these types of conversations. And this also speaks to the fact that this uh, this forum is definitely not just going to be a one-off. I know some, uh, many times I, we've all gone to meetings where everybody talks about you know accessibility or, or other um, important issues, and everybody feels good and gets to know each other, and then maybe it's a couple more years before we reconvene, but, but CCDA is committed to making these investments locally in these communities, and uh, we do plan to work with Monica and Robert and uh, organizations like Cecil, uh, the Central Coast Center for Independent Living, as well as local businesses to really highlight these issues and to get the resources where they're needed the most. Um, so I'm really excited. So this last question is, is for the whole panel. And um, I'll start uh, over here this time, here with, with Johnny. Um, with, and the, the question for everyone is, what suggestions do you have for improving understanding and dialogue between business owners and people with disabilities? That's a good question. Oh. You say that again? <laughs> Ask me that question again. Yeah, absolutely. So. Do you have suggestions for how to improve dialogue between business, the business community and people with disabilities, how we could all talk to each other better and work together better? Oh, I guess you say uh, just having open discussions and um, getting together more. Uh, uh, just uh, going on in the community, community and uh, um, Passing on, passing along information. Robert, we'll go, we'll go, uh, we'll go right to left this time. <laughs> All right. Um, again, as we sort of pointed out, it's just a matter of that interface, and so. I know, again, our, our groups are out in the community all the time going to local businesses, restaurants, Target, and, and many others, and um, for the most part, they're greeted warmly, they're, they're, they're helped. Um, I think those are the things that um, we need to continue to do with, with our businesses. And, and if something becomes a barrier, barrier is to sort of work at figuring it um, out. I also like Whitney's idea of if we could have more sort of hangouts within our communities. I know, again, my, my work gets me across lots of counties, and I know up in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, there are uh, autism-related hangouts, like the first Friday of every month, and, and you know, they go to pizza parlors and pubs and, and different places where, because it's a, a group hangout, they, they know they're welcome, and they know that they, the, the uh, business is preparing for them. 
So it's very comfortable to, for them to, to participate, participate in, that, in that group meetup because they know that people have thought it through before they showed up. So they're not worried about getting through the door or using the restroom. Um, and it's very comfortable for them. I think those things would be helpful. Thank you. Monica, I know you touched on this a little bit about elevating conversations, but do you have other ideas for increasing the dialogue between the two groups? And sometimes those groups are, they're definitely not silos and they cross as well, because you can also have a business owner with a disability too. <laughs> yes, thank you for the opportunity. So I, some of it is, again, a, maybe a little bit of frequency and having it more in front of the business and the community, and whether that's just you know, in a publication consistently, or a mailer, or just, uh, again, informal engagements where they're seeing it regularly, this is something to keep in mind, here are these options, and having a hangout or something here, here, this is a great way to be prepared and welcome these groups. We're a community, at least on the peninsula, with the visitor economy, so saying, you know, we have this conference coming in, a component of it, you know, maybe we have this area where it doesn't have to be a large hotel that can serve the community, but other the smaller restaurants that can as well. Thank you. Raymond, how would you increase the dialogue between businesses and people with disabilities? Uh, one thing uh, that could happen, and this has to go back to uh, back when COVID was around, you know, when COVID was around, like uh, Costco, Target, a lot of these stores, they had hours for people that are disabled that could come in. You know, if they do something like that one day out of the week where people that are seniors disabled can go in there and shop, you know, and not be, and not when, you know, they're really busy at a busy time, just set an hour aside, I think that would help out a lot, you know, and, you know, that's, you know, to make time that they can have a time set up and they'll have their time schedule. I think that would help out a lot. Thank you. I also think that speaks to uh, the idea of how access, access starts with all of us. All of us have a role to play in access, whether you're the CEO of a business or the person that closes the door at night or the person that sweeps the floor or serves the serves the candy at the wharf. We all, we all have a role that we can play in access. And so I think it would be really great if businesses, if you can make a practice of whether it's monthly or quarterly, you know, semi-annually, annually have, you know, regular meetings with your team where you might bring in an organization like, like Robert's organization or like Cecil, your local independent living center, uh, to, to remind your team about the importance of being accessible. You know, you might want to invite customers with different types of disabilities uh, to your space and ask them how they're navigating the space. And, you know, if you're opening a new store or something, you know, to deal with access on the front end instead of the back end. Um, and then also just making sure that there's someone designated in your organization who's regularly checking on those things. Are we maintaining our accessible features? Are we making sure that the aisles are clear? Are we making sure all those travel brochures are off the accessible bar? Those kinds of things. <laughs> um, and so Whitney, uh, last but certainly not least, because you're a very powerful voice, I would like to know, what, how would you increase a dialogue between people with disabilities and the business community? Well, that comes an easy one, April. Um, as far as like businesses and disabilities, um, and as far as like, going to a door or anything like that. Um, it's more of like helping each other out as far as if one business needs help and then the other and then another one and so forth. But I just think that uh, people with disabilities will be able to have like a strong life to uh, figure out what they want to do and what their future might be like. But um, that's what I wanted to say about it. But I, um, I all 
agree with you, but um, I just wanted to mention that. I think that's really powerful, Whitney. This is April. I really like what you said about, you know, people with disabilities are the ones that decide their own future. And you you said it in the beginning where you talked about how you just moved into your own apartment for the first time. And everybody remembers when they, you know, gained independence for the first time. And it's no different if you have a disability or not. Um, a lot of those challenges are the same, even if you might have to think of some things differently. And, you know, when I think about placemaking, when I think about, you know, how you build a business or how you build a park or how you build a build a a dais to a to a county chamber building um, you know think about think about who's going to use that space and who knows you know that person who needs you know access to a dais might be like a future a future leader or you know uh, that person who's renting an apartment from you, that person, maybe that person will become a realtor one day, or, you know, you have to be able to create spaces where people can see themselves succeeding in those spaces and taking, and, taking leadership. Yep. And April, not yeah. only that, but um, they can have like a stronger life or maybe even a, a stronger uh, vibe. Um, in that scenario of helping each other out or like maintaining uh, a goal of whatever they want in that scenario. I think that's the perfect way to end our panel portion, Whitney. And um, I want to thank all of the panelists for, for being here and sharing your perspectives. And we're now going to enter into uh, the final uh, half hour of our presentation today. We are going to go into our technical assistance portion. And uh, attendees who registered in advance had the opportunity to submit questions. And uh, CCDA staff went through those questions. And we picked 10 questions that we thought best represented uh, the pool of questions we received. And if your question is not answered today, you can uh, send us an email. We'll be posting our, our information at the end. Um, and we also are planning to prepare written responses to these questions uh, because they're questions that we get quite a bit. And we'll also make sure that your question is answered. Um, and uh, Michelle Davis, who I introduced earlier, who is a supervising architect with the Division of the State Architect, uh, she received those questions in advance, and uh, she's ready for me to ask them here, and uh, we'll be answering them, and these are all confidential questions. So, Michelle, the first question is, um, what is proper etiquette for assisting and communicating with customers who are hard of hearing, blind, or visually impaired? Well, thank you, April. I mean, uh, disability etiquette is really nothing more than ensuring effective communication in a positive interaction. Um, not all individuals with a similar disability are going to communicate the same way. So there's no hard and fast rules. Um, so it's best just to ask the person rather than make an assumption. Uh, for example, uh, if a, if the person is accompanied by an assistant or an interpreter, uh, you should still address the person, not their assistant. Uh, you don't want to talk about the person as if they're not there. Um, how rude, right? Uh, for communication ideas, uh, you can go to ada.gov. Uh, they've got some really great flyers on that for business owners. Uh, there's a wide variety of articles and information about specific methods uh, on the internet. Just recognize that you might need to have multiples to assist any particular type of disability. Thank you. And I'm going to kind of go a little bit out of order. Um, is it necessary or is there a requirement for businesses without designated parking to provide accessible parking? If a business provides parking available to the public, then they must have an accessible parking space. If they do not have parking at all for the public, then no, they don't have to provide accessible parking. 
Thank you. Where can business owners find up-to-date requirement information? Ooh, that's another thing that's available on DSA's website. Uh, it's a really long uh, website string. So I'm just going to tell you, go to dgs.ca.gov and search for DSA in our publications section. Our, our website has a bar across the top. And in that, there is the 2022 Access Compliance Manual. That actually has the entire uh, chapter for access compliance from the building code available for free, along with both federal and uh, DG or DSA commentary and guidance. Thank you. Another question that was asked, I'm going to go to question five. I'm going to come back to question two uh, later on purpose. Uh, do all levels, even multiple floors of a building, require to have an elevator or lift? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part, and I can go slower if you need me to, is if a business owner rents a second floor business with no elevator, are they liable for access violations? That's a complicated question. So under the California Building Code, the trigger for installing any accessibility upgrades is when a project is undertaken. So... Even so, so if there's no project being undertaken, there's no trigger under the building code. Um, and some buildings are permitted to never have an elevator installed. And that would be buildings that are three stories tall or less, or have 3,000 square feet or less per story. Um, so no, you don't always have to have an elevator. Some types of businesses do always have to have an elevator and that includes shopping centers and malls, uh, transportation terminals or depots, and most importantly, offices of healthcare providers. So the small businesses that are dentists, uh, maybe mental health care professionals, smaller uh smaller doctor's offices, those need to be either on a ground floor level or be in an elevator building. They don't have that exception. Uh, for liability, I, I'm not an attorney, so I'm talking generalizations here. Um, generally, if a business is located on the second floor of a building that doesn't have an elevator and perhaps is not required to have an elevator, then they still need to look at alternate ways to make their business accessible. And the code jargon for this is alternate method of compliance. Uh, so say, for example, a tax preparer is on the second floor of a building that does not have an elevator um, and the tax preparer needs clients to drop off papers and information. Uh, they could arrange with the building to have a drop off box, a secure box on the first floor, or they could arrange to have staff go down and meet customers and just take the paperwork from them. Now, say that same business also needs to hold meetings to review information with their clients, um, and they meet the with the able-bodied customers in their own conference room, but they meet disabled customers in a coffee shop. That would not be the same because the coffee shop does not offer the same level of privacy uh, especially, you know, for financial matters, that would be important uh, as their private conference room. So the business would need to look at a way to provide a private and accessible meeting location. Thank you. Our next question is, are bathrooms that are not open to the public, do they have to be available or do non-public restrooms need to be available? 
I am so glad somebody answered this question because the answer uh, actually changed recently. Um, some business obviously are required to provide bathrooms such as restaurants. Uh, the health and safety code does require them to offer bathrooms to customers. Other businesses that maybe are not required to have customer bathrooms um, may now be subject to AB 1632. So Assembly Bill 1632 is legislation that was enacted in 2022, and it amended the Health and Safety Code, uh, Section 118700, and requires businesses to allow people with eligible medical conditions, uh, such as Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, people with ostomy devices, they are now required to let these customers use the employee bathrooms. Now, there are certain conditions that do apply, so businesses should review those conditions and determine how to implement this requirement where it's applicable. So the short answer is yes, you may be required to make your bathroom available to certain customers. Thank you, Michelle. Our next question that we received is, could you please elaborate and explain the California Building Code or CBC update that includes privacy compartments for multi-user all-gender toilet facilities? Well, uh, without getting into the real detailed requirements, which would probably put everybody here to sleep, um, the, what happened is the California Plumbing Code was amended and it now allows all gender, all user toilet rooms uh, to be have multiple people in them at a time. We're we're sort of used to those single user toilet rooms that anybody can use. <clears throat> However, now it's uh, allowed to have a multi-user toilet room that anybody can use. And so the access provisions of the California Building Code were changed to make sure that all of the fixtures, both toilets and urinals, uh, are still provided in an accessible and private way. And uh, one of the bigger changes was that a sign at the facility entrance is now required and it has to announce that it is an all gender multi-user toilet room so that people are warned before they go inside what what they're about to what they're about to find. The individual compartments in those rooms also have to have signs indicating what kind of fixture is inside. So it needs to say either toilet or urinal. And that is to help people with vision impairments uh, not have to go into multiple compartments and come back out, you know, just searching for the one that they're looking for. Thank you. Our next question is, are commercial landlords required to help their business tenants in making their space compliant and accessible? Neither the state laws nor the federal laws that I'm aware of get involved in the commercial landlord tenant business arrangements. Um, so that really should be specified in the contractual agreement between the landlord and the tenant. There's no state laws that dictate who is responsible for upgrades. And the federal guidance that I've seen from both the Department of Justice and the US Access Board state that both parties may be responsible depending on the nature of the barrier. And what I have seen happen during my uh, experience is that both parties will get named in a lawsuit and then the judge has to sort out who is responsible for which element. Thank you. 
the, our next question is, do movable restaurant tables need to meet knee clearance and surface height standards in the ADA standards or CBC chapter 11B? So which one of those? Probably more ADA standards uh, because that is a civil rights law. The building code, California's building code chapter 11B is applicable to items and elements that are fixed to the building. So if the table is movable, then it's not fixed. Um, however, the requirements for clear floor areas and accessible routes to tables still apply because those aren't built elements, those are voids. And so the the space is required by both. Thank you. I'm learning. I'm, I know I don't know about all of you, but I'm learning quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Are there code compliant dining surfaces and are they covered by certified access specialist or CASP inspections? There are code compliant dining surfaces. I've found them and specified them in my work as an architect. Um, they can be a little tricky to track down. My pro tip would be to find one that does not have a center post with some sort of base or pedestal, you want to look for ones that have four legs. Those are the ones that are going to provide the required clear space underneath. Um, if a restaurant or other entity that has dining surfaces wants them to be covered by the CASP inspection, then they should probably tell their CASP to look at that. That's the great thing about the CASP inspections is you can pick and choose. For example, an owner can just have their parking lot done. If they can't afford to have the whole business done at one time, they can have their CASP inspections done in increments. Thank you. And we're going to go back to question two. I left this uh, on purpose because uh, I also want the other panelists to uh, chime in if they would like. How can businesses provide accessibility and raise disability awareness? So, Michelle, I'll start with you, and then I'll open it up to the other panelists to, to give ideas. You know, I think the best thing for business, I'm not an expert on raising awareness per se, but I think the best thing that a business can do is just um, keep your mind open to the possibilities and provide training, not just for the owners, but for the staff. Staff need to be taught how to handle service animals, effective communications, what auxiliary aids might be needed, um, you know, what alternate accommodations are acceptable to provide uh, for different situations. And that requires a little bit of forethought and planning. Does anyone else have any have any thoughts uh, about about that, about uh, how to raise awareness and create disability access access? Uh, I have an idea, April. Um, Go for it. So um, I just listening to uh, the back and forth questions between you, April and Mitchell, um, I've, I've got to say that uh, with everything that has been said here, um, I, I was just thinking about it just now, and I, I've to me, for me, I totally feel like uh, we all can agree on something as far as like to take one step at a time to like help other people out per se. But that's how I would uh, describe it like that. Go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you. Um, 
couple of thoughts. <laughs> One of them is that in itself. You know, to be really thoughtful and to approach things with an open mind, the folks that we work with, folks like Whitney, are some of the most brightest, optimistic. They're very, we have a lot of artists in our community. They're very much technology savvy. And they're the most loyal friends that I have come across, right? So they're, they're the best of the best of the people that are in my community. And so when I see businesses, as I mentioned, the, the soccer team, but also Embassy Suites, about a month and a half ago, we had to relocate our residents because of the power outage. And they greeted us with open arms. They're like, what do you need? We, well, we need rooms, right? And we need to be fed, right? Everything else is like, you know, we need access to the elevator. We have a bunch of equipment. We're bringing in medical equipment, oxygen machines. You guys have a problem? Like, no, no, what do you need from us so that we can make your people comfortable? You know, it's that mindset that just makes things great. And on the other hand, two things have happened um, that, that I'm, I'm hoping that folks will, will sort of turn the curve on is one, whenever I see um, an accessible animal, right, you know, there's two things. Either one, we all want to go up and pet it, and that's not always okay. But the other thing I see, some people like rolling their eyes, like is that a real service animal, right? Or they just want their pet in. It's not up for us to, to decide that, right? It's not, that's not our, our, our space, that's for them, right? And then the other thing, unfortunately, that, that happened recently was um, working with somebody and um, we had a, we have an intern who um, is deaf, so she brings her interpreters with her to different various places. And unfortunately, one of the spaces that we went into, they're like, well, do they all have to be here? And I'm like, yes, they do. We have somebody and that's her accommodation. And so it's those kinds of things that I think it's, we continue to have these forums, we continue to have um, our communities um, sort of um, come together. I think those two situations will, will hopefully happen less and less. Other thoughts from panelists about, about it? About how to increase access and awareness? Well, I have something to say, and it has to do with what Robert just mentioned right now about pets, therapy pets, and service animals. So I have my dog. I live in Monterey. I live in the heart of downtown Monterey. Anybody goes to Monterey, it's beautiful, you know, no matter where you go. But the uh, businesses there are so pet friendly. And I think a lot of businesses and a lot of people can take you know, can take notes from them because we walk around and there's bowls outside their doors with water and they're giving their, the pets, you know, snacks, water and everything. I walk around and everybody's like, hi, Lucky. And I'm just standing there. You know, they all know my dog. After, How you doing, Raymond? You know, but uh, <laughs> if more businesses were to become pet friendly, I think a lot of more people that are disabled and everything would be able to get out more. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Johnny, did you have uh, thoughts about increasing at how to increase access and awareness? Uh, maybe just uh, marketing it. Marketing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I don't know why that's, uh, I mean, I think you guys said it all already. Um, it's passing all information. Uh, yep, awareness, awareness, marketing to your to your customers. Thank you. Well, did you have anything you'd like to add, or, or any best practices, or anything? Okay. Well, I, I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. I'd like to thank everybody for submitting questions. Um, in the interest of time, um, we're not going to be able to take um, any, any questions because we want to talk about some resources that are coming up. And so uh, before I give my closing remarks, um, again, thank you to the panelists and to the customers and to everyone for being here today. I'd like to share a couple of resources that you could also find on the CCDA website. Uh, on the screen, uh, there's some business resources. There's a primer for small businesses from the ADA National Network and ADA.gov. There's some conversations happening uh, about effective communication and service animals and ADA frequently asked questions. So there you go. There's your answers about service animals. Uh, you can also learn 
about ADA quick tips, some tax incentives, and also there's the link on our website to certified access specialist or CASP inspections. And you can find all of these on our website and we are, will also be sending all of the, the Rogers PowerPoint as well as all the questions and answers and to the technical questions asked as well as all of the resources we gave today will be provided to all of the registered attendees. And we'll also be posting our recording, uh, the recording of this to the CCDA uh, website and social media. And as you know, uh, we also have been live streamed uh, locally. So we're really excited about that. So let's talk about how to go, where to go from here. I just want to take the time to thank our, our sponsors, uh, Building Business Back and the Monterey County Business Council for the refreshments earlier today. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor, the Monterey County Civil Rights Office and their staff, Natalie, Juan, Alex, Alex for the wonderful tech wizardry and his team, um, as well as Nadia from the Civil Rights Office here in Monterey County. And I just want to say that um, today is just the beginning, uh, that we're going to be f conducting follow-up programming in Monterey County. We're going to be uh, pr producing some more webinars with, with targeted communities. And we're also going to be reaching out to, to Monica and, and your team and other business leaders uh, and disability community leaders such as Cecil to talk about how we can continue this dialogue and really build on the conversations that were sparked today. Um, because as I keep mentioning, uh, access really starts with the local level and it starts with every single one of us. And so whether you're a person with a disability or a business owner or a government official or a service animal, like everybody has a role to play in equal access uh, for people with disabilities. And uh, the more people we can bring into our businesses to invest in our local economy, the, the stronger our community becomes, the more we can spark relationships over coffee or over talking about sea anemones and uh, at the aquarium, for example, uh, the stronger our community becomes. And I also want to thank the California Business Properties Association for being a strategic partner in, in, these, uh, in these forums. I'd like to thank Roger Miller uh, for being our technical expert today and to uh, Michelle Davis for answering all of our technical questions as well. I'd also like to thank the Monterey Commission on Disabilities and also, I want to highlight my wonderful staff, uh, Abby and Phil over here in the front box, uh, Abigail Ridge and Phil McFall, and all of our uh, CCDA commissioners. Uh, CCDA was created uh, by the California State Legislature in 2009. There's 17 commissioners uh, from a cross-section of community life, such as uh, developers, engineers, architects, other planning uh, people, uh, and people with disabilities, as well as representatives from the state legislature from both parties, the state architect, and the attorney general. And as we all come together, I, I urge you to, uh, I would love to have all of you uh, engage in our quarterly meetings. <laughs> Our next meeting is going to be held in Orange County on June 26th. We'll also be pairing that with another listening forum there as well. Uh, I also would encourage you to attend our webinars and technical trainings. Uh, we're actually having a uh, conversation co-facilitated co by the Pacific ADA Center on May 30th. We have a webinar series that we do quarterly with them. Uh, and one of the topics is service animals as well as Title III of the ADA. Uh, we'll also be doing later this year a webinar about how businesses can plan for access during the holiday seasons and the busy seasons. And we're also going to be talking about uh, in co in, to coincide with the ADA 34th anniversary, we're going to be talking about uh, how far we've come in the last 34 years, some trends uh, that we've seen in disability access laws and how the court's interpreting them and what that means for your business. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, please look for our toolkit on website accessibility that will be coming out later this year as well. So again, I just want to thank everyone for being here today and for your partnership and collaboration. And I look forward to many more opportunities to engage and make change in our community. Thank you. And I have a wonderful afternoon.
You can also like us on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, April.